Although we are likely miles away from each other and I can't see each of your faces, I have felt a real connection to you as we have all been on this journey of opening our hearts more to God. I pray for you each morning, and I'm praying that you're beginning to look closer at your priorities, putting God first and then tending to your heart, the most precious part of you. This series on priorities is in a certain order because I believe it's the order that makes life work. There is nothing more important than our relationship with God, so that's priority number one. And our next highest priority is our hearts, tending to them and opening them up to God. And one of the things that I pray about most intently is that you would know, would believe to the core of your being that God is crazy about you. It doesn't matter what you do or how much you have your act together, He loves you unconditionally. I hope that you've been hearing that message loud and clear as you've gone through opening your heart. We have to believe that God loves us if we are really going to put Him first in our lives. Trusting God and not worrying so much depends on believing in God's unconditional love. Having a healthy self-image and tending to our hearts depends on believing that God is crazy about you. And it affects the next priority that we're going to talk about today, our marriages. You can find an outline for this talk in your study guide in Lesson 14. Wait a minute, some of you might be saying. Why is it that marriage is the next priority? Shouldn't it be my kids? Aren't they the ones who need me the most? Someone once told me that when you have a child, from that day forward, your heart is going to be walking around in somebody else's body, and I really get that. But what happens when we allow our identity to be rooted in our mothering? What happens when we put our kids before our husbands? It may all work out in the short term, but in the long run, we end up with regrets. Now, I know that talking about marriage can hit a raw nerve within us. Oftentimes, this is the area of life where we have experienced the most disappointment and difficulty, and it's the area where we most need redemption and hope. So here's the good news. Our God is all about fresh starts. He loves to take us where we are and breathe new life into our circumstances. No matter where we're coming from, God can do something different in our lives from this day forward. I love the verse from Isaiah 42, verse 19. It says, See, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In the wilderness I make a way, in the wastelands, rivers. God can write straight with crooked lines. So regardless of what has occurred in the past or is happening in your present, there is always hope. The hardest aspects of our lives, marriage included, can be redeemed. I remember well a lovely summer day in 1991 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. My boyfriend had flown in from England and we went to Mass together on our way home from the airport. The sermon was on marriage, which I found interesting, although it seemed to have an odd effect on my boyfriend, Leo. He was fidgeting and constantly looking at me. And I later understood why, because after Mass ended, he asked if we could go up to the front and pray. And as I was kneeling next to him, he took my hand and said, If I promise to make you happy for the rest of your life, will you marry me? How could I say no to an offer like that? If only I'd been able to record what he said. Because the deal was, if I said yes, he would make me happy for always. So no one can fault me that I entered marriage with that expectation. We moved to Germany immediately following our honeymoon, and it wasn't long at all before I found out I was pregnant with our first child, Amy. I was sick and I was lonely. I couldn't speak German, I had no friends, and Leo traveled five days a week. It wasn't long before I sat Leo down and I informed him that there was a problem with our deal. I wasn't happy. And then I sat back to see how he would respond. And to my great surprise and deep disappointment, he became very irritated and asked if I expected him to quit his job and just sit at home with me. Regardless of what he had said when he was proposing, he had no intention of taking on the responsibility of my personal happiness, and I did not consider this good news. I had come into marriage with expectations. I had left behind my family, my friends, my church, and my country when I got married. And this left a huge void, and I expected Leo to fill it. I figured he should be grateful that I had been so accommodating. While the fact that Leo didn't even try to fill that void was very upsetting to me, it actually saved the two of us a great deal of heartache because in attempting to fill that void in my life, he most certainly would have failed. 
I needed to learn that the void that was in my life was to be filled by a relationship with Jesus Christ. No other man or person would be able to satisfy me. The late Ruth Bell Graham states it well, it is a foolish woman who expects her husband to be to her that which only Jesus Christ himself can be, always ready to forgive, totally understanding, unendingly patient, invariably tender and loving, unfailing in every area, anticipating every need and making more than adequate provision. Such expectations put a man under an impossible strain. Now, this doesn't mean that our relationships with other people, especially our husbands, do not affect us deeply. They certainly do. But even the best relationship with a nearly perfect man will never fill the void that is inside of you. Each of us was created with a God-shaped vacuum that only he can fill. St. Augustine said, you made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it finds its place of rest in you. So what does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? It's not the same thing as faithfully attending church. It's not the same thing as keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not the same thing as being a good person. I think it's helpful to think about a personal relationship with Christ the way we would think of an earthly friendship. Friendships start with getting to know things about one another, and then relationships grow as time is spent together. It's the hours spent sharing from our hearts and the experiences and the memories we make together that create a special friendship. As we look at having a personal relationship or an intimate friendship with Christ, we can have feelings of hesitation. He may seem like an unknown entity. We don't know him the way that we know our best friends here on earth. But if we'll take the time to get to know him and then spend time with him in prayer, he will become the best friend we could ever have. He will never move away. He promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. He'll never betray you. He will always love you. He wants what is best for you. The same can't always be said for husbands or wives for that matter. We've all heard the statistics regarding infidelity and divorce and Christians aren't immune from these heartaches. Many of us sitting here today have experienced the agony of the betrayal, the loneliness, the anger and the fear that results from a marital affair or a divorce. Our source of happiness and security must come from something other than our marriages. Having a personal relationship with Christ is an incredible gift that God offers us. But we need to take that first step of friendship and start getting to know him. There's no point in getting to know the Jesus of your imagination. Yet that is so often what people do. One of the important things to learn about Jesus is that he is interested in fixing your relationship with God the Father. When sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, the beautiful relationship that man had experienced with God was damaged. The perfect unity and friendship that they had experienced was destroyed, and a chasm between God and man remained. In his commentary on the Gospel of John, St. Augustine describes that chasm like this. Imagine a person on a ship who can see his homeland in the distance. He can see where he wants to go, but there's water in between. The sea is in his way and there's no way he can get there on his own. Man might attempt on his own to reach God and spend eternity with him through doing good things, but even the most saintly person will fall short. Because God is perfect, even a sinful thought would prevent a man from reaching God by his own efforts. God knew this and knew that we would need help if we were ever going to reach him. Because God is just, he couldn't just say that sin doesn't have consequences. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. Death is the punishment for sin. Someone was going to have to receive that punishment. Who deserves that punishment? You do. I do. But Jesus came to earth for the purpose of taking our place. When Jesus was nailed on the cross, all sin, past, present, and future, was placed on him. Think about how you feel when you've done something wrong. Think of the guilt, the shame, and the fear. Jesus felt all of those things, multiplied by the fact that he carried the sins of every person to ever live, past, present, and future. Second Corinthians describes what happened. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, if I go to the grocery store and I give the person at the checkout $150 and I receive a gift card in that amount, that is a fair trade. What I have given and what I've received are of equal value. But we gave Jesus our sin, and in return, he gave us righteousness. He paid the price of sin so that we would not have to. St. Augustine went on to explain that Christ came to the rescue and provided a tree by which a person can cross the sea. And this tree is the cross of Christ. No one can cross the sea of life unless carried by the cross. But whoever doesn't let go of Christ's cross will arrive at his true homeland, heaven. Through Jesus Christ, man was offered reunion with God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life, union with God, is a gift given. If I give you a gift, but you take it home, set it on a shelf, and never open it, have you really received the gift? No, you haven't. And I believe many of us have this gift from God sitting on the shelf at home. We were perhaps raised in the church, went through First Communion, Reconciliation, Confirmation, but we've never taken this gift from God and opened it up. What do I mean by opening up this gift? It means you look at these truths and recognize that they are true for you. You deserve death. You were separated from God. Jesus hung on the cross with your sins on him and paid that price for you. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The first step is to recognize your sin and make a break with it. If you've never done so, I encourage you to make a general confession. Our starting point must be recognizing our need of Christ. And when you do this, he opens his arms and wants you to receive him into your heart. He wants to come into your heart, to the very core of you. This is how he wants you to see the Eucharist. He loves you so much. He longs for complete intimacy with you. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit, which will fill you with grace, with strength, love, patience, peace, all the things we so desperately desire. When we open the gift that God offers us, all the fruits of the Spirit are inside, and God provides what we need to live the kind of life that pleases Him. But we need to move beyond recognizing our sinfulness, asking God for forgiveness, and receiving His grace. God asks us then to turn over control of our lives to Christ. He asks us to commit our lives to Him, to surrender. We have to make a choice. We have to decide. Committing my life to Christ means that I am no longer the one in charge. And I'll use a car to illustrate the point. I can drive through my life sitting in the driver's seat, deciding where I want to go and what I want to do. And I may even invite Christ to sit next to me. I'll talk to him a bit, maybe ask him to help me along the way. But at the end of the day, I'm calling the shots. That is not surrender. Or I can get out of the driver's seat, sit in the passenger seat, and let Christ be the one driving. For example, say I've just spoken rudely to my husband. Christ in the passenger seat might lean over and say, Lisa, that was really rude. You need to go and ask Leo's forgiveness and then speak respectfully to him. And then I would lean over to Christ and say, thank you very much. I really appreciate your sharing that with me. I see your point, but you've got to understand I had a really bad sleep last night and I'm really crabby and so this is just how I am today. Or I can get out of the driver's seat, sit in the passenger seat, and do what God has asked. Or take the example of worry. Say my adult daughter is dating a man that I don't like, and I'm determined to fix this situation. Christ in the passenger seat leans over and says, Lisa, you can't fix this one. Your daughter is an adult. You have to trust me. You can't control this one. And I say, oh, but I can you wouldn't believe how well I can control things. Or I can get out of the driver's seat, sit in the passenger seat, and devote my time to prayer and to exercising trust in God. When Christ is the one in the driver's seat, he gets to decide where we go. I don't ask for his advice and help. I follow what he tells me to do. 
that's surrender. And this is the single most important decision you will ever make in your life. It is more important than which career you choose or whom you marry. Have you made this decision? Have you turned over control of your life to Jesus Christ? Have you committed your life to him? Once we do this, we begin that second wonderful part of friendship, walking through life, making memories, and sharing experiences together. Through prayer, we can share our hearts with Christ, and he will never get tired of hearing all the little details of your life. And this is the first step to having a marriage that is transformed by grace. Did you enter your marriage with expectations? How have things turned out? My guess would be that while some things are the way you had hoped, there are areas of your marriage that are disappointments or sources of deep dissatisfaction and pain. This talk is sandwiched between a lesson on fear and a lesson on suffering. And this is not a coincidence. The truth is, marriage can be really, really hard. So where do you go with those unmet expectations? You go to Christ. He sees your needs and desires. Nothing is hidden from his sight. He loves you with an everlasting, unconditional love. He is all-powerful, and he is at work in your life. You can trust him with your hopes, with your expectations, and with your needs. He may not always answer you as you desire, but that is why we need faith. We need to believe, without seeing proof of it, that God has our best interests at heart and is at work in our lives. He sees every tear you shed. Nothing in your life goes unnoticed by him. Mike Mason said it well when he wrote, one of the most profound ways in which the Lord touches us and teaches us about himself and his own essential otherness is through the very limits he has placed upon our relationships with one another. It is an enormous source of human frustration that our need for intimacy far outstrips its capacity to be met in other people. Primarily what keeps us separate is our sin, but there is also another factor, and that is that in each one of us, the holiest and neediest and most sensitive place of all has been made and is reserved for God alone so that only he can enter there. No one else can love us as he does, and no one can be the sort of friend to us that he is. No one will be the sort of friend to us that Jesus is, and no one will be as great an enemy to us as Satan is. Jesus wants to transform your marriage. Satan wants to destroy it. Satan wants to destroy your marriage. Good marriages drive him absolutely crazy. He knows that God set up marriage as a sacrament, that if we live our marriage the way that God desires, then our acts of service and sacrifice will cause more grace to be poured into our lives. Marriage is to be a picture to the world of the way that Christ loves the church. And the last thing that Satan wants is for people to be encouraged by, ensured of Christ's love because of a dynamic marriage. So he sets out to destroy your marriage in many ways. And I'm gonna highlight two of them. Tactic number one. Satan is going to tempt you to be apathetic, to be lazy, to look out for yourself, to not give any more to your marriage than is being given by your husband. He'll whisper in your ear, it's good enough. Taking your marriage to that next level, that would take so much work. Let's just leave it as it is. He will tempt you to settle for ordinary when your marriage could be extraordinary. Both you and your husband need to be believed in. Your husband needs at least one person who will come alongside him in life and build him up. You are that person. Our world is full of people who seem to have it together on the outside, but on the inside are filled with insecurities. You may have experienced falling in love with your husband as a strong, confident man, only to find that after some time in marriage, the real man emerged and he wasn't who you thought he was. He needs you. There is no other person in his life who is as qualified as you to be his encourager, his cheerleader, his motivator. While women have many of their emotional needs met with other friends, most men do not experience that same level of intimacy in their male friendships. 
That is often a privilege afforded only to their wives. How many of us got married and although we thought our husband was pretty great, we had a little list of improvements that we thought our daily presence would produce in him. How many of you have seen those improvements occur? In my experience, I have found that no amount of nagging, suggesting books, or making comparisons to men who have it together in that area have done an ounce of good. What I needed to do was to accept him as he was. Peter Foster, an Air Force pilot, knew what a difference a woman's acceptance can make in life. Dr. Paul Brand, who was a surgeon in London during World War II, recorded Peter's story in his book, In His Image. Peter Foster was a Royal Air Force pilot during the Second World War, and these men were the cream of the crop in England, the brightest, healthiest, most confident, and often the most handsome men in the country. When they walked through the streets of London, people treated them like gods. Girls were jealous of those who were fortunate enough to go out with them. But the scene in London was far from romantic. The Germans were attacking relentlessly. For 57 consecutive nights, they bombed London. The Royal Air Force hurricanes that pilots like Peter Foster flew looked like mosquitoes pestering the huge German bombers. Although they were agile and effective, they had one design flaw. The engine was mounted only a foot in front of the cockpit and the fuel lines ran alongside the sides of the cockpit to the engine. If the plane received a direct hit, the cockpit would erupt in an inferno of flames. The pilot could eject, but in the one or two seconds it took him to find the lever, heat would melt off every feature of his face. The RAF heroes who survived these hits would undergo 20 to 40 plastic surgeries to reconstruct their faces. The plastic surgeons worked miracles, but still, what remained of the face was essentially a scar. Peter Foster became one of those downed pilots. After many surgeries, what remained of his face was indescribable. The mirror he looked into daily couldn't hide the facts. As the day grew nearer when he was to be released from the hospital, Peter became increasingly anxious about how he would be received by his friends and his family. Many of the airmen who had gone through similar injuries had returned home, only to be rejected by their wives and girlfriends. Some of the men were divorced by wives who couldn't accept this new outer image of their husbands. Some men became recluses, refusing to leave their homes. In contrast, there was another group who returned home to families who accepted and valued them, regardless of their physical appearances. Many became executives and professionals, leaders in their communities. Peter Foster was in the second group. His girlfriend assured him that nothing had changed except a few millimeters thickness of skin. She loved him, not his facial membrane, she assured him. The two were married just before Peter left the hospital. She became my mirror, Peter says of his wife. She gave me a new image of myself. Even now, regardless of how I feel, when I look at her, she gives me a warm, loving smile that tells me I am okay, he tells confidently. Tactic two, Satan will study you and identify your areas of weakness. Do you remember when we talked about our root sin during our first session? He will figure out if you are more tempted by sensuality, a desire for comfort and pleasure, or vanity, how others perceive you, or pride, seeking security in oneself. And perhaps he is tempting you in one of those areas right now. He will do what he can do to destroy your marriage by tempting you to give in to these root sins. So let's unpack how each of them can derail a good marriage, starting with sensuality. Here's an example from the Brennickmeyer house. I'm finishing up the dinner dishes and Leo has just sat down in a comfy chair. Although Leo has helped get the children to bed, if I add it all up, I really do have the more points this evening. My day has really been the more demanding one. I'm quite certain that Leo has sat down for more time than I have, and I do believe that his quality of sleep last night was better than mine. My to-do list was longer, and it definitely was easier for him to spend the day with grown-ups than for me to spend the day with small children. Now, I know that Leo would love nothing more right now than a cup of tea, but the last thing I feel like doing is making it for him. I have the opportunity to serve Leo and to show him I love him, 
but Satan is tempting me to give in to the sin of sensuality, to put my desire for comfort and pleasure above my desire to actively love my husband. And how about vanity? We struggle with vanity when people's perceptions of us are more important than doing the right thing. Get a group of women together and it usually doesn't take very long before someone is complaining about her husband. One person's story tops the next person's story and a good gossip session is on its way. We so often forget that we are the guardians of our husband's reputations. The way that we speak of our husbands is shaping the way those around him see him. Now, I know that friends may find it irritating if you refuse to gossip or speak negatively about your husband, but if you can resist that urge, you are strengthening your fight against vanity and protecting your marriage. But if you can resist that urge, you are strengthening your fight against vanity and protecting your marriage. Satan tempts us with the sin of vanity when we start to worry about how others will perceive us if we give in to our husbands. Our culture applauds a woman who stands up for her rights, who does what she wants to do, who doesn't let a man keep her under his thumb. And in many circles, a woman who will let her husband be the leader of their home is looked down on. But when we don't give our husbands respect and instead undermine their leadership in our homes, we are eroding their masculinity. We are communicating to them that they are not enough, that we don't respect them or trust them. And this is devastating to a man's ego. What are your thoughts about serving your husband? Are you concerned that if you serve your husband, people will think you are a doormat? If we allow that concern to get in the way of serving our husbands, we are giving in to vanity. We are not called to serve our husbands because men are superior to women. God asks us to serve them because as Christians, we are asked to serve others. We're called to emulate Jesus and be a servant as he was. In Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28, Jesus said, Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And St. Paul continued with that teaching in Philippians 2, 3, when he wrote, Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Marriage is one place among many where God desires that we set our own wants and needs aside for the benefit of another person. You may be thinking, but my husband doesn't deserve to have me serve him. Ephesians 6, 7 addresses that concern, and it says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. If you struggle with this, remember that you are living for an audience of one. Who is that audience? It is God. So behave as if his approval is all that matters, because that is the truth. There's a difference between being a servant and serving. When I serve, I decide at a particular time that I will do a particular thing. I am in control. Tomorrow I may or may not serve, depending on the circumstances. By contrast, a servant is available whenever the master calls for whatever the master needs. In Matthew 20, 26, Jesus says that if we want to become great, we must become servants. And who is our master? Our master is God. This means that we are called to be available whenever he calls for whatever he needs. And Satan tempts us with the root sin of pride. Every time we are tempted to insist that we are right, we are struggling with pride. I can literally struggle with this desire to be right in all sorts of ways. I know a right way to load a dishwasher. I know a right way to make a bed. I definitely know a right way to get my kids ready to go out in public. So if Leo attempts any one of these activities, I want to instruct, I want to correct. And I'm sure this reminds him of someone that he knows well, his mother. Now, Leo loves his mother, but he isn't attracted to his mother. And I lose sight of the fact that it's more important that I show a heart of gratitude than for the job to be done just the way I like it. It's hard to let go of being right in the little things, but it doesn't get any easier with the big decisions if we can't let any of these small issues go. No time in my life was I more tempted to give in to the desire to control than when our son William injured his leg in Mexico at age three. He'd been watching his brother's soccer game with Leo and he was playing on a soccer goalpost. 
He fell, the pole came crashing down, and William's femur was broken. When I got the news, I rushed to the hospital, just in time to be told that William was going under general anesthesia for surgery, and I became a completely out of control woman as I didn't trust the medical care there, and I hadn't had anyone explain to me what was going on. Leo tried to calm me down, which frankly made me even more irate. I couldn't figure out any other way to fix the situation, so William did go in for surgery. He came out and woke up with a cast from his waist to his ankle. But unfortunately, something went wrong and the leg didn't heal properly. William needed another surgery. At this point, my parents did a little research and they found the best pediatric orthopedic surgeon in the Washington, D.C. area, and he was willing to treat William. He said time was of the essence, though, and that he was concerned that if the Mexican doctor made a mistake that affected William's growth plate, one leg would be longer than the other. My dad also had a friend who flew planes to airlift missionaries out of countries to bring them back to the States for medical care, and he was willing to come and get William. I definitely thought this was the best solution. He was willing to come, but we had to decide right away so he could arrange things. Leo felt we should trust the Mexican system and stay. And we have never fought like we did that night. I screamed, I threatened, I pulled out everything in the book that I could think of, but Leo would not budge. In a fury, I grabbed my cell phone and I left the hospital. And I sat outside and called a wonderful friend of mine and I told her the whole story. What can I do? I asked. You know what to do, she said. No, I don't, I said, irritated. That's why I called you. She said, you need to go back in there and let him make the decision, she said. I know you make sense, but you cannot take William out of the country without Leo's consent. Someone has to give. It is doing William more harm to have you screaming over his head than to let Leo make this decision. Let him decide. It will do wonders for your marriage. You've got to trust God in this and let him work. You see, this was a soulmate friend, and she knew the desires of my heart. She knew that for almost 10 years, I'd been praying that Leo's heart would be set on fire with a love for Christ. That instead of experiencing tension whenever we talked about spiritual things, I prayed daily that there would be a unity, a strength. It took everything in me, but I went back into the hospital room and through a clenched jaw, I said, you decide. And Leo looked at me and said, I don't believe you. And I said, that is the best I can do at the moment. I'm making a decision to let you decide, to let you lead. And I'm asking God to take care of my feelings. And I am praying that they would follow. And something in Leo broke. And for the first time in our marriage, he asked me to go and get the Bible so that we could read something about getting wisdom from God. We prayed together. I was able to hear him asking God out loud to help him to make the right decision. And only a woman who's waited 10 years for a moment like that can appreciate how precious it was. And then Leo decided that we would stay. And William had another surgery. I'd like to say that this time it worked, but it was actually worse. We had weeks of William being in traction, of literally not being able to move an inch, of around-the-clock care with him sleeping in our bedroom. In the end, we did airlift him to the States. But all of this was done with peace between us. When we finally got to the States, the doctor looked at William's x-rays, and this is what he said. You could have saved yourselves a whole lot of cash and hassle if I had just seen these x-rays first. He is just fine. God was in control of William's leg the whole time. I didn't need to worry. But God would still have been in control even if William's leg wasn't healed or never healed. God has the big picture. I do not. The question is, do you trust God enough to let go? Is your God big enough to see you through? Do you believe that he can take care of you or of your child in any situation? And do you have enough faith to trust him for your marriage? Are you willing to trust God to make your marriage into a picture of the way that Christ loves the church? Are you willing to give Christ that intimate place in your heart so that he can fill your heart with his grace that will overflow into your marriage? Say yes to Christ.
and your marriage will be transformed by his grace. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, marriage really can be tough. And such a big chunk of that is because we come to marriage and we want that other person to be to us that which only you can be. I pray that our vision of who you are would grow bigger, that our trust in you would grow, that we would come to you and that you would reach into those hopeless places in our hearts where we think that nothing is going to ever change and that you would breathe new life. I pray for just a super abundant outpouring of your grace on each one of our marriages and that the world would see something really different because of the way that we are willing to serve and to sacrifice and love, not just in the easy places, but in the hard ones as well. Amen.